All right, so this lecture is going to be a combination of 4.4, which is the endomembrane system, and 4.6, which is protein sorting to organelles. I think this is the hardest part of the chapter, and this is why I'm, I'm going to focus on specifically 4.6. I think the rest of it, when you talk about what's the function of the peroxisome and the lysosome, uh, the mitochondria, etc., I think you could probably learn that without the benefit of me lecturing, but the process of transporting manufactured goods throughout the cell, whether they be lipids, whether they be proteins, is essential. And if you want to understand how essential it is, look at various disease states. Cystic fibrosis, diabetes, those are two examples of aberrant protein trafficking leading to a disease state. So the cell is highly organized, not just because it has a variety of structures. It's highly organized from a standpoint that here's the protein I'm, ma I'm making. Here's where it needs to end up. I have to follow a logical path to arrive there. And if I make a wrong turn and my protein doesn't get to the cell surface or my protein doesn't get to the lysosome or my protein doesn't get to the mitochondrion, now what I have is I have a non-functional cell which ultimately is going to impact the health of the host. So the endomembrane system consists of various organelles, including the nucleus, the ER, the Golgi. Lysosomes and vacuoles are also offshoots. But I want to emphasize that the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus are the two major and most important parts of the system. Minor players like the lysosome, like vacuoles, like the plasma membrane are important in specific pathways, but they don't necessarily apply to all pathways found in the cell. Linking these uh, 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 far-reaching organelles, right? The endoplasmic reticulum, uh, reticulum is not connected to the Golgi. So how can we make sure that the proteins, lipids, etc., whatever it is I'm transporting follows that path? We're going to see small bubbles of membranes called vesicles, which are going to be extremely important in connecting these various compartments. So here it is. I, the book does a nice job of shading those organelles in purple which are involved in the endomembrane system. I really like the way the cell, excuse me, I really like the way the textbook organizes uh, the colors of the cell based on if they're semi-autonomous, part of the endomembrane system, etc. So let's start with the ER. The ER represents a network of membranes that are sort of flattened. Um, inside uh, the ER, the hollow, fill, uh, the hollow space is called the lumen. So that's the compartment. When you look at the ER, this uh, network of membranes, we can divide it into the rough and smooth ER based on the presence or absence of a ribosome. So when you look at these structures under a microscope, as you've learned, the rough appearance of the ER is caused by ribosomes. And because ribosomes synthesize protein, that's the main function of the rough ER. The smooth ER uh, lacks ribosomes but does contain enzymes involved in a variety of processes. Uh, the modification of lipids, which we know is extremely important, for example, in building membranes, uh, detoxifying poisons, uh, their metabolic centers, so they're in your liver and they're in charge of metabolism of carbohydrates, uh, storing of calcium in your muscles. We call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but it is the smooth ER. So the uh, smooth ER serves a variety of roles within the cell. Here's what I mean when we talk about uh, the studded appearance. This is an actual electron micrograph where you can see the ribosomes sort of uh, uh, peppering the membrane of the rough ER here. 
So we have what we would call the center of manufacturing, right? That's the ER, manufacturing lipids, manufacturing proteins. Now, the Golgi is somewhat like the warehouse, right? Because if you have goods you're producing, you have to put it into a central location. So from there, you can then send off the packages to their desired destination. That's what the Golgi does. The Golgi accepts all of these various components produced by the ER, it then tags them, packages them, modifies them, and then sends them on their way. These are also membrane-bound compartments. Uh, we know vesicles, as we've talked about all already, is what uh, connects the ER to the Golgi. And the uh, traditionally uh, defined functions, even though I said sorting and acts like a warehouse, secretion processing and sorting of proteins is what the Golgi does. Here we go. Now it's very important that there's polarity to the Golgi. What I mean by that is there are different ends. We have the cis face of the Golgi, which accepts the shipments from the ER. And these little bubbles, or membrane enclosed lumen, called vesicles. The uh, Golgi then, as we move from the cis, then goes to the medial end. At the medial, uh, or the middle, is where the modifications of these products are made, the fine tuning, if you will. And then from the trans side, that's where we ship off the cargo to its desired destination. Now, what you need to understand is there's what's called the cis maturation model. There are some wonderful uh, uh, animations on our wiki page that you can go view. But essentially what happens is the Golgi is constantly being built up and broken down. It's being built at the cis face due to the fusions of vesicles. What vesicles represents are parts of the ER membrane that have broken off and then travel and fuse to form these compartments. So in reality, the lipids that make up the cis face of the ER really originate, excuse me, the cis face of the Golgi really originated from the ER. And so now these compartments sort of move and mature in this direction. We can see at the trans face, we're actually losing parts of the membrane by forming a new vesicle. So at the trans face, we're breaking down mature Golgi. At the cis face, we're building that Golgi apparatus. And so it's the logical sequence of events. We produce products in the ER. We sort, modify, and ship from the Golgi. That is consistent with any product that is produced by the endomembrane system. It follows this path, ER, vesicles, Golgi. Now where we begin to diverge is here. Once we leave the Golgi, where is our product destined? For example, this is a neurotransmitter that is meant to be secreted from the cell. Or this could be insulin, which is a protein meant to be secreted from the cell. We're going to see there are other destinations for that cargo as well. So we should have a general idea of the chronology of transport through the ER. Here's a nice video where they actually labeled the cargo. And what you can see is you could see the shipments leaving the ER now being uh, taken to the Golgi where now you could see all of the, the energy is, is uh, located. And now you could see from the Golgi, we can see those particles being transported to the cell membrane and throughout the cytoplasm. Look at that. It looks like water spreading through the cell. And we can see some of that shipment is being sent to the plasma membrane where it will be excreted. I mean, that's a wonderful view of a cell is a busy place. A cell is, is akin to a, the transportation system in any major city where things are coming and going and moving in an orderly fashion to ensure that the products that I'm producing end up where they need to be. It's very sophisticated. And we're going to see in a second errors in that system have severe consequences on overall health. So now let's get into section 4.6.
the fate of newly synthesized proteins. The reason we emphasize proteins so much is proteins carry out just about every essential function in the cell. They aid in transport, they're structural in nature, they're catalysts, uh, they maintain homeostasis. There isn't a job in the cell that a protein doesn't carry out. So the synthesis and transport of these proteins to their desired destination is a critical step in the maintenance of cellular health. Now proteins can exist uh, in different places. We could have proteins that are meant for the cytosol. They're produced in the cytosol, they stay in the cytosol, that's where they function. For example, enzymes involved in catabolism like glycolysis are produced and stay in the cytosol. We also have co-translational sorting. Co meaning, means during in this case. So during the process of producing protein, we actually uh, shuttle that right to the ER. And from the ER, that protein gets shipped to its destination. For example, the uh, enzymes that are part of your small intestine digestion don't start there. They're actually produced and ultimately secreted into the small intestine using co-translational sorting. Post-translational sorting means that the protein is produced and then targeted to its destination. For example, any proteins that are meant for the nucleus, for the mitochondrion, for other organelles are produced and uh, shipped through this post-translational sorting. So the first one is fairly easy here. Now we have to have an understanding of the flow of genetic information in a cell. So DNA contains the information through the process of transcription in the nucleus. That information is transcribed into mRNA. mRNA then leaves the nucleus into the cytosol where it is used to make protein through the process of translation of which a ribosome is critical. So here we have, right, mRNA is located in the cytoplasm. Here it is, ribosomes bind, they start to read the information and link together amino acids to make proteins. Now it is very important that we recall there are different ends of a protein. We have an amino terminus and we have a carboxyl terminus. As we've learned, proteins are always synthesized N to C. So the first amino acids have an amino group sticking out, that's why we call it the N-terminus. The last amino acid in the chain has a carboxyl group sticking out, that's the C-terminus. So this represents the first amino acid in the chain. There is going to be information, as we're going to see in a second, stored in the N-terminus that's going to determine the fate of this protein. So for example, those proteins remaining in the cytosol will be completely synthesized there, they'll fold in the cytosol and they'll remain there to carry out whatever function they may have. Fairly straightforward, right? So translation started in the cytoplasm, finished in the cytoplasm. In co-translational sorting, the ribosome which begins to translate is recruited to the rough ER. I think this is something that students miss constantly. The ribosomes we see on the rough ER don't start out there. They start off as free ribosomes, meaning available in the cytoplasm. Because of the information stored in the newly synthesized polypeptide, the ribosome is then shuttled to the ER where protein synthesis continues. That protein synthesis ultimately is completed within the ER lumen where the polypeptide folds. Very different than what we just saw here, where translation began and ended in the cytosol. Here, uh, translation began in the cytosol, ended at the ER. That protein is then packaged and sent in a vesicle to the Golgi. The Golgi processes it, modifies it, and then sends it off to its final destination, whether it be the lysosome, whether it be uh, to the plasma membrane, or whether to be secreted out of the cell. The third pathway proteins can take are, are part of what's called a post-translational sorting. Here we see ribosome binds, translation begins uh, and ends in the cytosol. However, that protein that's uh, fully uh, matured 
is then shuttled to one of the various organelles uh, within the cell, the nucleus, mitochondrion, case of plant, chloroplast, and peroxisome. So what we can see is three very diverse pathways of which proteins can take. This is the one I'm going to focus on, the co-translational modification. Extremely important. Proteins destined for the rough ER start out being synthesized by free ribosomes and ultimately get targeted to the rough ER through what's called an ER signal sequence, which is located in the N terminus. Let's go step by step here. All right, so our message is in the cytosol, ribosome recognizes and binds, begins to link together amino acids. As the protein grows, we can see it begins to exit the ribosome. As it exits the ribosome, the amino terminus is exposed to the cytoplasm. Now, there's a very specific sequence of amino acids within this ER that constitute an ER signal sequence. When that is exposed, specialized proteins in the cell called SRP, signal rec recognition particles, bind to that ER signal sequence once it's exposed. Now what's special about SRP is that its receptor is located in the rough ER membrane. So now, due to the affinity between SRP and its receptor, now the ribosome, which is still translating, is actually docked now onto the surface of the rough ER, of which there are channel proteins to which the protein is inserted. So there we go. Now we're co-translating. As we're translating, we are inserting into the lumen of the ER. The peptide continues to grow. SRP at this point is released where it can then go find more ER signal sequences. At some point in the maturation process of this protein, there's an enzyme called signal peptidase that's associated with this uh, transport protein whose job it is to cleave the ER signal sequence. Here's why that's important. Not all of the information in the mRNA ends up in the protein. Here we see an example of the first set of amino acids in the N terminus ultimately do not stay in the final protein chain. Its only purpose was to recruit SRP and allow the ribosome to bind to the rough ER to continue the process of co-translational uh, protein synthesis. Now, once protein synthesis is completed, the ribosome falls off, and now it's able to go find another message. So what is this ER signal sequence? Well, it's found in the N terminus. As we said, it's targeted by SRP. Here is a typical ER signal sequence. So here's what I'd like you to do. Get out your ebook, get out your textbook, go to uh, chapter th uh, three, look at the various amino acids. Here we have methionine, methionine, serine, uh, phenylalanine, valine. And what I want you to do is determine what type of amino acid, whether it be nonpolar, polar, or charged, what is the most frequently found amino acid in the N terminus? Press pause and do that for me. All right, as you begin to look through what you notice, hydrophobic, 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 another one. All the check marks here represent nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids. Three and I'll put in there. So a vast majority of amino acids in this area are hydrophobic. So SRP is able to bind that sequence through a series of hydrophobic amino acids that it has in this binding groove. Remember, proteins fold based on the distribution of amino acids. In this case, there's a series of surface exposed hydrophobic amino acids that are able to recognize and bind that ER signal sequence. Once we can establish that interaction, 
we see SRP then gets recruited to the rough ER where we can now go uh, finish translation of this protein, which ultimately is going to end up in one of three places, right? It can end up in the lysosome. It can end up embedded in the ER, excuse me, embedded in the plasma membrane. or it can end up being secreted out of the cell. Some really nice papers here. Here's what I'd like you to do. We, we talk about maintaining a blog. Everyone always likes extra credit. Here's a really nice paper to get you used to reading primary literature from the Endocrine uh, Reviews Journal. Uh, if you go to our library, go to the electronic database, uh, look in journals, Endocrine Reviews, you should be able to find access to at least the abstract, if not the entire paper, where they talk about beyond the signal sequence, protein routing in health and disease. And I'll just read this here quickly for you. Receptors, hormones, enzymes, ion channels, structural components of the cell are created through protein synthesis. But the act of making that protein is not enough for proper function. We know that those proteins must be shipped to their proper location. Its components must be correctly compartmentalized. The mechanisms by which we maintain the fidelity of localization warrants attention in light of the large number of molecules that must be routed to distinct subcellular loci locations, the potential for error and resultant disease. And so it lists some of the common diseases that result from my protein not ending up where it needs to be. So mutations can have lots of different effects. If the ER signal sequence is mutated, what do you think is going to happen to its ability to be shuttled to its correct location? That's something I want you to think about for our exam. Now, as we talked about just quickly, vesicles have coproteins and receptors. I'm not going to get into T snares and V snares, but I want you to appreciate is that at the ER, the ER membrane contains um, protein receptors, as well as lipids, that ultimately make up the vesicle. Notice here in this case, the proteins here in blue contain the cargo. That cargo is in the lumen of the ER and now is in the lumen of the vesicle. As the vesicle fuses to the cis face of the Golgi, notice now that cargo is directly put into the lumen of the ER. So in the co-translational system, the cargo never faces the cytoplasmic side. It's always kept protected by the lumen until, in the case of a secreted protein, until that particular protein ends up outside the cell. There are other sequences that are extremely important within the cell that are part of the post-translational uh, uh, synthesis pathway. So there are signals that tell a protein that go to the nucleus. Or those that say, hey, stay in the ER because you're an enzyme that detoxifies poisons, for example. Or these are proteins that are targeted for the mitochondria. In each case, what we have are protein sequences that are directing where that protein ultimately ends up in the cell. And any errors within this sequence or errors in the transport will ultimately cause a mislocalization of the protein, which is going to create a cell that is malfunctioning or not functioning at all. And that is really what the disease state represents. So here's the final figure I want to summarize chapter four with, since this is the last lecture. It sort of brings together all the different um, components of a cell. We've broken up the eukaryotic cell by a compartment here. We have the nucleus, we have the cytosol, we have the endomembrane system, we have semi-autonomous organelles. And what it shows you is how each part of the cell has its own distinct function, which works in concert, which works beautifully, that allows the cell ultimately to carry out its essential functions.